We are currently busy with hominid sequence, which is outcomes 5, and in this video we continue with that. So far we've learned how evolutionists believe that modern Homo sapiens evolved from an ape-like organism. So basically, as progression happens from number 1 in this picture to number 5, the features of the skulls you're looking at here will go from more ape-like to less ape-like. So obviously the face becomes flatter, the brain capacity becomes larger, the palate becomes rounder, the shape of the mouth is as a flatter face in humans than it is in apes, and all the features that we've actually looked at in video one. So now we're going to just focus at the two most complex um, species, which is Homo neanderthalensis and Homo sapiens. And then we're going to add two extra family members, two new family members, to the hominid sequence. The information shared in the previous video on hominids was all summarized on the table that is available on Calabrum. But the information in this video, you'll have to make notes on your own because it's not on that table. And we're going to specifically focus on the trends in the habits of um, the more complex homo species. So these are the organisms that we've looked at so far. We know that Australopithecus is the ape-like, the most ape-like species that was mostly arboreal, very ape-like, living in trees, but was bipedal habitually. So now and again it would walk on all fours. The Homo species, however, were all completely bipedal and out of the trees. They're all walking upright now. So when we look at the Homo species individually, we realize that when we look at their trends in their habits, they're also going to get more complicated and more sophisticated as we move from Homo habilis towards Homo sapiens. If we look at these, we can see the difference in the tools that was used by Homo habilis on the left and Homo um, erectus on the right hand side. Now Homo habilis on the left hand side used tools, simple tools that we call older one tools, simply named after the place that it was found. And these guys actually took rocks or stones and just beat them together, hit them together or grind them together to either chisel them down, shape them down, make them sharper or to cause them to flake because these uh, rock flakes would be quite sharp. So they would use that to cut meat. Homo erectus did exactly the same thing. They would also take stones and shape them. But you can see in the picture that they've actually made more of an effort. So their tools, their rocks are sharpened much more and shaped much more. You can see in the picture the front, the side and the back view of some of these. They actually attach these rocks to, to stones um, or to, to sticks rather to make simple hand axes. It's theorized that Homo erectus evolved into Homo neanderthalensis. Now these guys are in a level of their own. They have specific hunting techniques and burial practices. Now this skull looks a little bit more robust than the one that we saw in the previous video, but you can still see it's pretty much a human skull except that the lower jaw is a bit more protruding and then we've got those big massive eyebrow ridges. Now the wonderful thing about Neanderthals um, is that there's a huge amount of data, there's a huge amount of fossils to actually study. More than 300 fossils have been found. So that gives us a, a, a bigger picture to look at. If you think of Australopithecus, there's only a few samples and something like little foot is actually little bones because it's only three bones. Um, they're trying to build a whole model or theory about a specific organism based on only a few bones. But in the case of the Neanderthals, there's lots of evidence. On this map, you can actually see every red dot represents a site or a cave where Neanderthal remains was found. If you look at the passage, you can see that the classification of Neanderthals is um, double. They give you two possible classifications. So as we look at the classification, let me just give you a hint for the prelim. The name for humans is Homo sapiens. Now in grade 11 we learned that the first word Homo refers to the genus name and the second word sapiens refers to the species name. 
When you handwrite these in an exam in a paper, HOMO is with a capital H and both the words HOMO and SAPI needs to be underlined. While when it's typed, it'll be in italics. Now if you look at the text again from the previous slide, you'll see that they give Neanderthals two possible classifications. The first classification, and that is the original that is believed, has been believed for some time, is that Homo neanderthalensis and Homo sapiens have the same genus name, but they are different species. If Neanderthal's species and sapien species is not the same thing, obviously it means that Neanderthals and sapiens, according to this classification, wouldn't be able to interbreed and produce fertile offspring. But as we learned um, in the last lesson, um, because of the recent Neanderthal genome project, Neanderthal DNA was analyzed and there was found to be many, many similarities. So according to that, evolutionists and scientists are a bit baffled and they are changing the classification. They are saying no, um, Homo neanderthalensis should be Homo sapien neanderthalensis. So according to that classification, this new one, Homo sapiens neanderthalensis and Homo sapiens sapiens would be the same species, just different subspecies, which would explain why you find Neanderthal DNA in living humans currently in Europe. They either interbred with one another or they are the same species, but it wouldn't be uh, possible if Neanderthalensis was still classified Homo neanderthalensis. Neanderthals were quite smart actually. They lived in small family groups in caves mostly, but sometimes in simple constructions. They were making ponchos and blankets to protect them from the cold by using the skin of things that they've killed. There's also evidence that um, they were able to splint broken bones. So if you x-ray some of the fossils actually showed that they splinted a broken bone so the scar tissue is there but the healing happened and the leg is now straight so they had to have splinted that they were also able to control fire which means making it keeping it a certain size and then putting it out again so controlling fire and they produced art it is believed because Neanderthals only died out about 40,000 years ago that obviously there was a time that humans and Neanderthals roamed the earth at the same time. And sadly, because humans were smarter than Neanderthals, they probably outcompeted them or exterminated them uh, due to competition for food and space. Or the Neanderthals might have just died out because of climate change or some weird disease or obviously a combination of all these factors. So that brings us to Homo sapiens or Homo sapiens sapiens, which has been existing on this planet in the shape that we have now for more than 100,000 years. So all the facial features and the skeletal features we already covered last lesson. These would include the use of more complex tools, language, cooperative behavior, and so on, and obviously the introduction of an omnivorous diet, which would make our jaws less robust, the jaws further back, the teeth is smaller, but the habits, the trends, and the, the art in humans we're going to look at only next week in the next video. So this brings us to the new family members, to the hominid family. And the first is called Australopithecus sediba. Now these, um, there's actually two partial skeletons that were found that represents Australopithecus sediba. And because it's Australopithecus, it shares obviously all the traits that the other Australopithecines have, um, they have in common. On the diagrams, the darker areas represent the actual bone fragments that was found, while the lighter areas just is an image of a skeleton to show you the position of the bone fragments. So as you see, it's two partial skeletons. However, there is enough evidence there to show that this is an Australopithecine. The forearm and magnum on both of these partial skeletons show a centrally placed position, which means uh, bipedalism. Then the femur that was found shows its inward angle, which also shows bipedalism. The long arms and the large chest and the pelvis, though, shows 
uh, typical of an ape, that these animals were knuckle walkers. So exactly like an Australopithecus, some bipedal, some arboreal characteristics puts it into this classification. The other new family member is Homo naledi. Now what's super exciting about Homo naledi is that it wasn't just one ske um, skeleton, it's also not a partial skeleton. It's about 1,550 numbered fossil elements found quite recently and they're still digging, they're still finding and because these parts are part of complete skeletons, they found almost 15 or more complete individuals. Um, which gives us a great idea of what's happening. You can see this is some of the parts that they found, which is on display at VITS, and you can actually go and touch them and, and uh, work on them as paleontologists do, not us as the public. But it's amazing because it's the first biggest find ever on the continent of Africa. The fossils consist of babies, children, adults, elderly individuals, and they were found deep under the ground in a room called the Dinaledi Chamber, which is part of the Maraping system by the Sturkwintin Caves. And you can see from the skull, it's basically a human skull, except for the eyebrow ridges that's quite prominent. And then look at the dental arch and the shape of the teeth. Beautiful human sample. Another very interesting point here is that this chamber is very, very remote. And they've also found some pieces of uh, mouse and bird remains. And also the bones um, bear no markings of scavengers. So they reckon those bones, those entire skeletons were placed in those caves. So it implies intentional body disposal by Homina Lady, and then the mouse and bird remains might have been like an offering or something like that placed with the body, like in a sacrificial type of manner. This photo shows the team of paleontologists that actually go into the cave to retrieve these bones. Now you'll notice that they're all females, they're all girls, and they're pretty small. And this is because the cave is so small and so difficult to reach that these guys are the only ones that actually can get in there. So in this video you can see how um, small it really is and how tiny your body needs to be and how nice it is to squeeze through here. So have a look at this video and see if this is a career option for you. The man is, is hopelessly insane. Six remarkable young scientists squeeze through a 12 meter crawl down a chute 18 centimeters wide. To get these fossils of a new species of early human ancestors, Homo naledi. It's really unusual to see all women scientists in these kinds of situations where you are expected to enter into and work within what might be considered a fairly risky or dangerous situation. Ordinarily it's the men jumping at these things, but I think because of the size limitations on getting down into the site, women were given more of a chance to sort of get their foot in the door. <laughs> Hello, Command Center. This is Marina at the top of the chute. I'm just about to descend. Okay. Thank you. Bye. You start by descending down a fairly narrow shaft and some tunnels. You have to crawl on your stomach for about three meters. Then you enter into another chamber. This is what we call the dragon's back with a four or five meter drop on either side. At the top of the chute, you start the 12 meter descent into the chamber. Okay. Okay. You then go through another passageway into the main fossil chamber. The first thing that came through my mind when I went through the final slot was Howard Carter opening Tutankhamun's tomb and Lord Carnarvon saying, what do you see? And Carter says things, wonderful things. Wow. God, this place is beautiful. There is no find like this anywhere else. <laughs> this is extraordinary on every level. It's almost hard to put into words what this is going to mean for the story that we tell ourselves about where we came from. We're really after this story. This is what excites us. 
it's not entirely clear at this point how it got there. They are so unusual. It doesn't seem to fit any currently known paradigm for fossil hominins. Unfortunately, the level of CO2 within this particular chamber of the cave system has spiked to a, a critical point, so we need to leave so that we're not all suffocating. <laughs> we need to get to the surface. CO2's up to 1,300. Those first couple of days were probably some of the hardest, most difficult days of their life physically because I was scared to leave people down there for too long. I was trying to rotate them out, which forced them to climb in and out this torturous path. How fantastic. And they, of course, were like horses chomping at the bit to get in there and, you know, were ready to get out and ready to go back in. Have a blast, huh? Thank you, will do. To be face to face with these fossils and to be touching them and handling them, it's very humbling. And so just being able to be a part of this find is a wonderful honor.